Mm, sir, I can see that the contrast uh, also passing, uh, although it is passing uh, towards the uh, third part of the duodenum and uh, proximal duodenum, but it is not as much uh, contrast filled and the proximal duodenum, second and first uh, part of the duodenum is uh, grossly dilated. That is in my pro, I, I can uh, say that there is some stenosis or some uh, obstruction at the level of the third part of the duodenum, which is causing retrograde dilatation and uh, Oh, distal obstruction somehow lats band mm, i can say sir and band usually will come like like this yes sir yeah. they will come Just vertical like a, uh, eccentric you know uh, appearance and it's like layers you know see contrast is here and contrast is here and it's going like, so it's what they call this sign sir this sign is called as uh, screw sign sir Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, this one. Uh, sir, this one is uh, sir wind sock. Hi, wind sock sign. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, that's used to direct the airplanes. The for... diverticulum, uh, yeah. sir. It is for duodenal diverticulum, sir, which is uh, uh, enroaching in our in its uh, intramural uh, location, sir. Yeah, so this is a duodenal web. Uh, yeah. uh, usually, for the third part, the duodenum giving this duodenal web, sir. Yes. And so yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, as you clearly and nicely mentioned, there is a proximal dilatation of the stomach of the first and second part of the duodenum um, uh, with distally collapsed bowel loops, and there is like eccentric filling defect uh, with tapering of contrast uh, through the third duodenum which is uh, uh, characteristic or giving the shape of one sock, uh, one sock sign. So that's very important to recognize. Okay, right. so right. very classic right. of the adrenal web um, stenosis. Mm, so this is extra abdomen uh, of a child. It shows uh, dilated cut loops. They are noted um, uh, in the abdomen. They are more on the right hemi abdomen. And uh, multiple air food levels they are also noted and uh, some air is also noted within the rectum mm -hmm. and uh, so can I know the age of the patient? Yeah, the patient is uh, like uh, one week old. He's an urinate. And uh, sir, my topmost uh, um, so most likely diagnosis is sir, uh, meconium ileus. Well, so uh, if we go back to the uh, what we mentioned at the beginning of uh, uh, neonatal um, abdominal classifications, we always, um, and patient is coming with obstruction and tolerance to feed abdominal decision, then first of all, we have to identify is this is a proximal or distal. So this is uh, or high or low. So this is a distal. You see multiple dilated bowel loops. So this is distal bowel obstruction. In a neonate, then there is a list of differential yes, diagnosis. So what are the differential diagnosis of distal neonatal bowel obstruction? Uh, so it can be um, Hirschsprung uh, disease. Okay. It can be uh, um, uh, immature uh, uh, or okay. sir, uh, meconium plaque syndrome. Yes, okay. Uh, and uh, it can be anorectal uh, uh, atresia. Okay, excellent. Or malformation. Mm -hmm. So these are the few... Uh, uh, so always start so from... Uh, for Zara, start from like... This <coughs> is the easy way to, rec to remember. So we say, okay, this is like... This is um, distal bowel obstruction. Uh, so I'll, I will go from the ileal regions, so ileal atresia or ileal stenosis, then meconium blood uh, uh, syndrome, then, you know, uh, meconium uh, obstruction, then, if I, uh, you know, uh, hairsprung disease, then anorectal yes, So if you go all the way and colonic also uh, stenosis, colonic uh, uh, at least, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this, this, this is the way you go by anatomical landmarks. So, uh, distal yes, regions, then the colonic um, reasons, then, uh, then the anorectal malformation. So, what's the 
Are you not taking a step here? Mm, sir, um, uh, sir, then uh, contrast study. Um. Okay. What, what, what type of contrast study are you going to do? Uh, sir, um, gastrographic study. Yeah, I know, but with, through which opening? Upper or lower? Sorry, sir? You're going to do contrast like uh, lower uh, or contrast enema or upper GI? Uh, sir, contrast enema, sir. Sir, contrast enema. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, because upper GI is not recommended and you will not get any results. So the, the, the most important is to do contrast enema, to do and identify the reasons. Okay? So if you do contrast yes. enema, you see like uh, multiple filling defects within the colon, especially with, um, within the uh, ascending colon, cecum, and also terminal ileum. Think of what? Meconium extraction, especially in the cystic process. If you see like a discrepancy in the large bowel with the reversal of the then think of hair sprung disease. If you see only microcolon without any filling defect, then think of unused colon. And unused colon is most commonly due to ileal atresia or ileal. So it's very uh, valuable to go with trust cinema and bowel obstruction in, uh, in baby. What do you see here? So there is, a, um, this is one of the spot known to contrast tenema. It is out in the uh, large gut and it is small in caliber. And the contrast is not passing into the small gut and uh, there is dilatation of the small gut in the background. So, um, so this is most likely meconium ileus. And uh, yes, there is multiple filling defects as you can see here and even here. Yes, sir. Multiple filling defects. Yes, sir. Even. Yes, sir. Meconium pellets. Yeah. So, meconium pellets. Thank you. So, that's that's very helpful to go with contrast enema uh, and to check. Um, yes, sir. Because in this, this way, we exclude hair sprung disease because the rectum yes, is the hardest part of the large bowel. There is no reversal of reclusimoid ratio. Uh, you know, um, uh, there is multiple filling defects seen here uh, within, within the colon and even uh, into the terminal ileum, dilated proximal small bowel loops. So these findings goes with yes, uh, meconium obstruction. So um, this is a frontal abdominal radiograph of a newborn showing presence of nasal gas tube here and multiple dilated bowel loops. Um, there is a multiple Leucenses involving bowel loops. If you concentrate more here, you can see like a circumferential leucency within the wall. Also here in the right lower quadrant, there is like a mottled appearance. Even if you concentrate more, you may see a linear leucency projecting over the liver shadow, as you can see here. Uh, so this is the typical appearance of diseased bowel. The bowel loops are separated from each other. Usually, it falls over each other, and it has what's called a mosaic appearance or mosaic um, gas distributions. Uh, and this is the normal and healthy bowel because the bowel will be over each other. But if you see it like separating from each other, uh, fixed, dilated, not moving, through the, like you know the follow-up with motile delucency, with air delucency within the wall think of necrotizing enterocolitis. And uh, it develops because of the immaturity of the mucosa lining of the small bowel. And in, 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 in um, addition to uh, some, uh, you know, um, infection, that's why the treatment is to put the patient in PO to start the patient on IV antibiotics. So um, the pathology of necrotizing into colitis is very complex um, and related to um, immaturity of the mucosal lining of small bowel, related to associated infection, uh, related to some sort of, um, you know, hypoxia due to prematurity. Um, and um, the best thing is to, or the treatment is to risk the bowel and to start IV antibiotics. 
it may end up with like structures, perforation, um, um, ischemia. Patient may end up with either ileostomy or um, you know a colostomy. So it's the the prognosis is very variable and depends on how extensive is the involvement of the small bowel. Okay, this is another you know patients with neck as you can see here. There is like very um, clear mural eustensi. And if we see this one, then follow-up X-ray is very important. Okay, I'm provided with a extra abdomen of a neonit showing multiple lines. Uh, NG tube is seen passing. It's ending up in the stomach. Mm -hmm. There's paucity of the bowel loop seen. <laughs> Uh, I can also see a dilated bowel loop within the mid abdomen. Mm -hmm. However, there is uh, no rectal gas is seen. Mm -hmm. So this likely represents a distal bowel obstruction within a neonate. So I'm trying to look for further causes of the distal bowel obstruction. You have the Real, just uh, yes, sir. Thing. Yes, sir. Thank you. So if you have this bowel obstruction, you're gonna see, you know, a normal caliber. This this bowel loop of normal caliber, and this one of normal caliber, and this one also of normal caliber. Yes. But, but if you uh, but, uh, if you check this, big this large. you think it's uh, intramural or extramural, and why? Sir, I think it's extramural because I can also see a. Evidence of the falciform ligament, which shows that it's a pneumoperitoneum. Yeah, fantastic. So what do they call this one? If you see the falciform ligament, what is I, uh, Yeah, there's a sign name related to it. I don't remember the sign, but I can uh, I figured that out when I saw the falciform ligament. So that's it's extramural here. Or they call it American football sign. Yeah, American football. Uh, okay. Or form ligament sign due to presence of free air. This is clearly outside the bowel lobes and outlining the falciform ligament. And that's very important to recognize because this is a pediatric surgery emergency. In yep. addition to that, you, you see the flank is distended. Distended and there's fluid also within it. There's also this nemo, hydronemoperitoneum within it. Some neonatologists even, or some pediatric surgery may ask for something extra. What is that? Okay, something extra from me. If, if, the ser if you call the surgeon and said, no, I'm not convinced. He said, I want you to convince me more. What else are you gonna do for him? I'm going to get, go for a lateral, lateral yeah. decube film to see. Yeah, yeah, so I can see there is a, a nemoperitoneum. Mm -hmm. With outlining the left, uh, outlining the right chest wall, mm -hmm. right uh, abdominal wall, sorry, and then there is a uh, which is displacing. There's also density below it, which most likely to occupies to be fluid displacing downwards, and yeah, the bowel loops. Liver also, yeah. So this is again a fee, uh, and there is this is another lucency as you see. Not all the air will move up, but oh, yep. very important also to tell your X-ray technologist that should take time, you know, because the air takes time to move up. Um, okay. you, especially in case like if it's uh, longer standing or adhesions, you may not have uh, the air moving quickly to the okay. uh, non-dependent side up. So we need to take time, at least five minutes. The patient okay. should uh, lie on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Otherwise you may ask for alternative if the, if the, if the neonatologist tell you that, they can't take the decubitus. What else that you could do? Uh, we put pressure on the abdomen to take uh, the expiry. Uh, okay, that's for the chest to take the expiry. If, um, they, if they, they can, uh, if they tell you we can't flip the patient. The patient is sick. We can't flip him. Then what else that you can you can tell your X-ray technologist? Because he may call uh, you. Uh, they prevent me from putting the patient on his side because the patient is sick. Yeah. Mm, I know the procedure that we do for chest for air trapping, and I do can recall here. For neck, sometimes, especially in trauma, they can't put the patient lateral neck. We do what called what cross table, 
horizontal cross table shoot through. Yeah, shoot through. Yep. So if they can't flip the patients, they may do cross table or lateral shoot through. Okay. 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 They film on this side and they bring that in and the X-ray film. Yeah, exactly. This is uh, X-ray pelvis frontal projection of a skeletally mature patient. And uh, the uh, left uh, femoral epiphysis is small and right femoral epiphysis is not visualized. And uh, left uh, uh, um, femoral metaphysis is, is displaced uh, superiorly and laterally. So my diagnosis is developmental dysplasia of hip. Which one is more worse? Right of that. Which one is more worse? The right or the left? Said left. Okay. Uh, usually, if there is like a, enough stress or coverage, for here is there is a cartilaginous coverage. You will the, the femoral epiphysis will develop. Here is not developed. So that means the right side is the worst one. And um, the estab if you measure the estabular angle on the right side is more wider as compared to the left. So if you see um, the ossification center of the femoral head, that's a good sign because this one could even heal with like only frog leg position or hip spica. But if this one didn't develop, this, there's um, a concern and some even orthopedic surgeon may go for arthrogram or they may ask for MRI of the pelvis to make sure that the um, uh, ossification center is there and there is no, um, you know, absence or uh, afascular necrosis or non-development of the uh, femoral epiphysis. So usually if I see the femoral epiphysis as on the left side, yes, the left side also is dislocated uh, superolaterally with shallow left stable roof, no doubt. But also on the right side, the non-visualization of femoral head is another um, uh, poor signs indicating that there is um, um, right side DDH, which needs to be even uh, managed um, early and also to recognize whether there is an AVN or uh, um, a development of, uh, you know, any any complication there. Um, as you know, I just present one this one to show you, to, to you that um, how to recognize it, but uh, more importantly um, is um, um, to avoid doing X-ray unless the patient is passing six months. So from six weeks to six months, you could do hip ultrasound, which could give you um, the measurements of the angle. If alpha angle is more than 60s, that means it's it's normal. You could even do like stress maneuver to make sure whether the hip is subflexible or not. And it's very a great um, and valuable tool. I know some centers, they may, don't have, may, may not have the experienced ultrasound technologies to do the hip ultrasound, to do the measurements. Baby may be crying, um, but it uh, saves the patient from radiation. And it's uh, a very important screening tool um, in, in any suspicion of DDH. Again, both sides, there is no visualization of femoral heads, but this one is more dislocated superior laterally, and the right acetabular angle here is larger or bigger than the left side. So here is more uh, um, pronounced the DDH on the right side, though it's on both sides. Mentally immature patient uh, pelvis, uh, where I can appreciate that the both femoral heads are uh, displaced from their normal position and uh, are displaced superiorly uh, and are not in their normal position. Where I can also appreciate that the uh, femoral heads are uh, uh, showing pseudo arthrosis with the iliac bones mm -hmm. and. Uh, with, um, okay, fine. So, 
we, 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 uh, that, that's very clear bilateral DDH with pseudo arthrosis or pseudo joints with the iliac bones. But what else? What are the incidental findings that you could identify from pelvic X ray here? Uh, sir, uh, I think there is increased interpendicular distance or any, uh, there is any vertebral defect or anomaly? Yep. So there is a serial element of the lower sacral yes. spine and widening of the interpendicular space. Okay. Yes. Sir. Dealing with yes, sir. spina bifida. Yeah, posterior spinal dystrophism or spina bifida. So, and yes. what else here? What is this tube? If you get the diagnosis, I will give you a gift. <laughs> <laughs> it's making me more confused. No, that's but this is also belong to the the things. You know, he has a spina bifida. Any any VP shunt? Any VP shunt? Is this is an appearance of Ibishan? No. Mm. Um, so what it can be, like in the uh, neurologically deficient patient, uh, any suprapubic catheter trust me, but it just the point tip is outside yeah. catheter. Yes, it's outside. And okay. So well. where is my gift now? No, it didn't recognize it yet. How can I give you a gift without <laughs> recognizing <laughs> this type of tube and why it's there? Okay. Uh, it's related any type of to the patient conditions. Oh? I tell you, this is a school age patient. Uh, mm -hmm. She's embarrassed by the fecal incontinence that he, she's having. So, hmm. And um, uh, they spoke to interventional radiologist to insert this type of, you know, uh, tube to improve her, you know, like social activity and to make her like not embarrassed in the school. Okay. Maybe I complicated more, huh? <laughs> <laughs> So I don't want gift, but I, I want to know the answer. The patient has fecal incontinence. What are those? Yeah. If this patient has spina bifida, as you can see from mm -hmm. here, and probably she yes, has, like, you know, um, mm -hmm. fecal incontinence. If she reached to the school age, it's embarrassing that she has a diaper in the school. Uh, and in order to, um, you know, make her like, you know, only having bowel evacuation at sleeping every night and going next day nicely without, without diaper to the school, then we bought what's called secostomy tube. So secostomy tube is okay. inserted to, uh, you know, improve the defecation or, you know, evacuation of the feces. So uh, we insert this one. We uh, the mom will be trained to put uh, an enema, fleet enema, throw this one before going to sleep. The the patient mm -hmm. will evacuate the whole large bowel. Next day she will be fine. Will go to the school. Will perform her activities. Then the uh, mm -hmm. night, same thing. So the the bowel will be uh, like uh, adapting this habits. So she will be evacuated each night. And in between, she will be free to go without any uh, you know, like risk of like uh, uh, soiling herself or himself as a boy. So it's um, one of the things that we put uh, like secostomy tube for a patient with, with fecal incontinence, especially those patients with uh, posterior spinal dystrophism. Usually, they have uh, uh, fecal incontinence, and when they grow up, they have like embarrassment. They usually soil themselves, whether they continue on uh, diaper or they just have this uh, small tube that they could even uh, inject. Um, even if they grow up, they, they could do it themselves. They have the fleet enema with them. They inject themselves before going to sleep, and that's it. They will be free so from... Why in the cecum? Pardon? Why, why in the cecum, sir? So why, why is it cost me? Because the cecum is the start of the large bowel. And the feces is only in large bowel, and there is a leucecal bowel. So you need to 
to to wash out and to irrigate the cecum to push all the the the, the feces of, from the colon so the colon will be empty so the patient will sleep on empty colon next day he can go he can eat he can do everything by the time the uh, the fecal matter reached the, the the colon on the next night he will evacuate it again uh, and that's why it's it's uh, called like this they call it you know um trap door or you know chait um secosome tube patient she is a 40 year old obese uh, came with limping to the emergency room sir uh, this is a x-ray uh, APG or for this of a uh, uh, child uh, there is the async asymmetry is noted on both uh, bilateral footprints there is a, uh, a discontinuity of uh, the subcorrhentic uh, uh, region of uh, uh, right uh, femur. Uh, the neck of the femur is, uh, however, the head of the femur is in the as an aesthetic volume, but the uh, distal part is raised upward. <clears throat> um, there is a soft tissue swelling is around the hip joint is also noted right side with the. Uh, <clears throat> um, um, the eyelid bones appears to be normal. The left, the right hemi pelvis is slightly tilted. Uh, however, the uh, left side appears to be normal. Both psycho eyelid joints, the right psycho eyelid joint is not clearly visualized due to bowel gases. However, the left appears to be normal. So it is, uh, I, I would like to ask about the any trauma. <laughs> Hello. There is no history of the slumping. Sorry, Hello. sir. Thank you. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. There is no history of trauma. So, what's your differential diagnosis at this stage? So, no trauma? No trauma. Or maybe the, the patient didn't remember that she had a significant trauma history. But, uh, I can't understand. Uh, there is an interruption in your voice. Yeah. The patient presented only with limping, no fever. She didn't recall any history of trauma or significant trauma. Okay, so trauma. The things that she is mentioning that she was on steroids. Sir, so, she was in, uh, on steroids, and there is a history of trauma also. No, trauma, no. No trauma. So, sir, it is, is it a pathological fracture? Okay, so, but it has a specific name, especially in the pediatric age group. We know it's a type of fracture, yes. It's um, Salter Harris type 1 fracture. But sir, that's called... What? Salter Harris type, sir. Yeah, type one, and this is called. They call it, you know, this is uh, again. You, as you mentioned, the um, uh, femoral head is somehow is displaced medially. If you compare this one, the appearance to this one, um, you see it's a bit rotated and yes. medially dislocated. There is widening of the broad plate. So that's called what skivvy or slippage of capital femoral epiphysis. So that's very common, especially in teenage boys or girls from, uh, you know, Afri Africa, Caribbean um, origin. The, uh, sometimes maybe idiopathic, sometimes the reason is because of steroid, um, uh, uh, you know, usage, sometimes due to endocrinological problems like patient hypoparathyroidism or hypothyroidism. Uh, it's also related sometimes to obesity. It even happens sometimes with the trivial anatomy. So it needs to be recognized. And the most important is to be, uh, you know, referred immediately to orthopedic. Otherwise, there may be a interruption of blood supply and uh, subsequent development of AVN. Uh, AFAS necrosis is one of the complications of skivvy or uh, slippage of capital femoral epiphysis. 
And um, one of the uh, treatment is binning. They, they pin the femoral head to the uh, metaphysis. So it's very important to recognize. It's also very uh, important to manage it early. Otherwise, the patient may develop AVN. So um, this is um, another entity, uh, patient who had flattening sclerosis and the fragmentation of capital femoral epiphysis with some irregularity of the overlying acetabulum. So this is a patient with, if, if he is a boy uh, falling between four and eight years, we think of birth disease or leg calf birth disease or um, idiopathic afasco necrosis. Other differential diagnosis of this one may be patient with, uh, who is secular, patient uh, post uh, scurvy, patient on steroids. So uh, these are the differential diagnosis of AVN um, that could happen to um, uh, growing uh, femoral head. This is a 18 months old boy with recurrent shortness of breath attacks. You see here there is widening of the mediastinum, deviation of the trachea to the right side. So this is not only a thymus. A thymus tissue will not deviate the trachea to one side. So if you see this one, then this is the time to obtain further imaging. You may even start with lateral. And if you do lateral, you see the retrosternal UCNC is absent. The trachea is pushed posteriorly. There's a rounded mass in the anterior mediastinum. So this patient should go for a cross-sectional imaging, which shows large anterior medicinal lesion with some areas of hypodensities, indicating presence of necrosis. There is no fat or calcification. So the differential diagnosis would include lymphoma at the top of the differential diagnosis. Gerb cell tumors or immature teratoma is less likely. You know, um, another like um, um, TP, also is another entity, but um, or another differential diagnosis. So um, a thymoma, but it's more on an adult group. So most commonly is uh, lymphoma, uh, given that it's not invading the blood vessels, just only um, separating them and displacing them posteriorly. And even there is no much compression on the airway, despite large size of the lesion here. So this tend to be a lymphoma. with abnormal antenatal ultrasounds. And this is the full term. Lungs volume are okay. There is rounded obesity, which is very important to recognize because this rounded obesity in patient and in, in neonate may, may be a cyst that contains fluid. If it didn't resolve with follow-up or tends to be a cavitary lesions, then you may need CT scan. This is a CT scan then immediately and you see there is a fluid containing cavity in the right lung with adjacent also cystic changes. So this is a CPAM or CCAM or, uh, you know, um, previously called CCAM, but nowadays they call it CPAM, congenital pulmonary airway malformation. It has five types, type one, type two, type three, type four, and type zero. The most common is type one when the cyst range from two to 10 centimeter, type two less than two centimeter, type three it's micro cyst, type four is a solid, and type zero is unlined cyst, and it's very really tough to differentiate type zero from type one. This is a neonate with funny skull. As you can see here, there is like um, exaggerated convolutional markings. Even on the lateral part of the, on lateral view of the skull, you see there is multiple leucenses involving the inner table of the skull. So this is not only uh, a normal convolutional markings because of the growing um, um, gyri. It should raise a suspicion of what's called a copper beaten skull due to increased intracranial pressure patient with hydrocephalus. 
So you need to recognize it and you may ask for CT scan. Uh, and that's what, how it appears or the cup or beaten skull. Um, another differential diagnosis of this one is a patient with Kayari malformation who has a Lukenschkadel skull, but usually there is a, a real defect in the skull and the pathology is due to collagen defect, not due to increase intracranial pressure. So that's the three differential diagnosis for this appearance is uh, copper beaten skull or silver beaten skull, exaggerated convolutional markings, although it shouldn't involve the occipital or the frontal, the only the normal variant convolutional marking is only limited to the parietal skull. The third differential diagnosis is the Lukenschkadel skull in patients with Kayari malformation. But usually there is a defect in the brain, a real defect due to collagen uh, abnormalities. This is a child with a skull abnormalities also. You can see here there is large skull with intrasutural bones. That's what's called, you know, warmian bones. If it's more than 10, then it's pathological and think of the differential diagnosis. This is a 3D CT scan. And the um, differential um, has been collected in the mnemonic or what they call it pork chops. And you, you know it from, you know, the first year of uh, residency from Chapman, differential diagnosis that this include bicondyl cystosis, sinus imperfecta, rickets, kinky hair syndrome, all the list. Uh, this is a neonate with maternal diabetes. You see here there is segmentation anomalies of the lower thoracic spine, some effusion anomalies of the posterior part of the right lower rib, non formation of the lower part of the lumbosacral spine. So this is a caudal regression syndrome. It's very important also to, to recognize the caudal regression syndrome.